Hi, this is Todd with Esoteric Car Care. Today we're going to be talking about Ferrari paint correction. Okay, Ferrari paint correction. If you've been following along in this series, we've done a handful of videos already talking about Ferrari 488, talking about Ferrari ownership, kind of what to expect uh, with these cars. Uh, and then on this one, we've spent some time discussing with our customer what we want to achieve with it. We know this customer, we've been doing business with him uh, for many years now. We understand he wants to get basically the best example of this he can uh, in this beautiful Rosso Scuderia. Uh, so what we're doing is we're going for a very high level of uh, paint correction. Now leading up to this, once we inspected everything, once we talked to, this, uh, to the customer, came up with a game plan, made sure expectations uh, are met on it, we started in with our prep process. And part of that was stripping off the old paint protection film, if you recall. Uh, that way we can also see what uh, the paint is like underneath there. We went in, got everything cleaned up, did our chemical and mechanical decontamination processes so that we know exactly what we're seeing in the paint. So, you just jump into polishing, right? No, actually not uh, that easy. Despite the fact that we have done hundreds and possibly thousands of Ferraris over the year, and we know this paint extremely well, we still have to go in to determine what uh, uh, process that we're gonna use. Fortunately, over the years, uh, with that experience, we have developed a system or a process that works incredibly well, and that process includes specific products. It's not as simple as just looking at the car and going, Yep, looks good. That's very subjective. Unfortunately, much of the detailing world goes off of subjectivity, which is why we have got our uh, uh, DOI meter. That tells us exactly the condition of the paint. That tells us exactly the differences that we're getting from one process to the next. If I can measure 5% difference, I'm not gonna see that with my eye. But if I know that I'm gonna get that customer that better of a look by taking the measurements, finding out what's gonna work best, I know that that car is gonna have uh, the best results, not just in a subjective uh, manner. Now with this, you know, you, you hear people talking about gloss. Um, you know, that's one of those things, yes, this does measure gloss. It's got about five or six other readings that it, uh, that it does as well. Gloss figures can be deceiving. You can take a look at two identical parts. You know, we did a big article on the Z06 Corvette that we built a, a couple of years ago, and in there I showed the side skirts on it, where one of them, we sanded it down. It was nice and flat. The other one had tons of orange peel, tons of texture in them. Nobody's gonna look at those two and say they both look equal. Everybody is gonna point to the one that was nice and flat. Both of those items had the exact same gloss reading. So what we're talking about, it's not gloss, it's clarity. That's what most people perceive as gloss. It's how much clarity that we can get out of the paint. This allows us to achieve as much clarity as we possibly can. And don't get me wrong, we're not going in and sanding down the finish to make it uh, look better. That is a huge no-no. Unfortunately, you see way too much of that in the detailing industry. You want to preserve as much material as you possibly can out of there. So when we're doing these, we're going for maximum looks with minimal amounts of, of uh, material that we're removing for the finish. Over the years, we have found some items, like I said, that, that works uh, the best. It's gonna be either Jeskar or it can be the FG100 uh, from uh, Manzerna. When am I gonna use one uh, over the other? Well, it depends on what we see on the car, what we measure, what our eyes see. Um, you know, People ask all the time, hey, I've got this car coming in, what's gonna work best on it? Don't know, I'm not there. Uh, until you start doing the test sections and evaluating your processes, you don't know exactly what you're gonna get. Fortunately for us, we've done so many of these cars with this process, we know what to expect, but we still go in and we do our test sections and we evaluate what we're getting because each of these cars could be a little bit different. So that's why we still have to go in and figure out what's gonna work best for it. So we've got uh, these two in our compounding stage that we're gonna team up with the Meguiar's uh, microfiber cutting disc. There's a lot of other options uh, out there. When it comes to cut and finish combination, this 
with either of these are giving us the best results. And when you're doing a multi-stage uh, polishing process like we're doing on this, you wanna go for the best cut and the best finish on your compounding stage. You're not doing any correcting on your finish polishing stage. And the better your finish is on compounding, the better the finish is gonna be on uh, the finish polishing stage. So we think about those things when we're trying to evaluate what's gonna work best on here and what's gonna work best for two-stage system. So that's what we're using on the compounding stage, but we're still testing, we're monitoring, we're, we're evaluating, we're taking measurements, and we're seeing what's giving us the best results on this particular car on this particular day. As I said, uh, it's gonna change up a bit. Um, and then when it comes to finish polishing, we like using the Sonax Perfect Finish, uh, usually with a white uh, Rupus uh, finishing pad, sometimes a yellow, depending uh, on the paint. This enables us to do a two-step process. It bridges that gap. You don't have to do a mid-level process. Uh, this has got a lot of cutting ability and super fine finishing ability as well, just because of the abrasives. We've done a video specifically uh, on this product here that goes into some more uh, detail about that. But after we do our compounding, we're doing our finish testing. We're taking our measurements. We're looking at it visually to make sure that it's getting as much clarity uh, with as good of a finish uh, as we possibly can out of it. Each area of this car, we may have sanding marks that we're gonna go into uh, in the next video. Um, we may have to have just a little bit different process than the other area that we're just getting out your basic swirls, um, holograms that, that come from uh, the factory uh, with their uh, polishing process. So we may have to change that up a little bit as we're going through that process and take each section of the car a little different. You can't just take one system and, and run with it over the whole car. You gotta stop and you gotta evaluate and you gotta look at it, determine what it needs. That's why you don't just jump into the Ferrari world for polishing paint because these cars have uh, their own specific needs. Yes, in the end, it's just paint, but the, the processes and what these go through to get on here are gonna be a little bit different than your average Honda uh, or, Actory, uh, or, or Acura. That's a, it's a factory setting. These are more hand-built, and because of that, you need to be uh, more careful uh, about it. So these are the products, and we talked a bit about the processes that we're gonna do to get the most out of the finish on this Ferrari. This is what the customer wants to go through, so we're going to be very meticulous in our approach, and hopefully during this process, educate you, whether you're a Ferrari owner or whether you're a detailer, on exactly what goes into making these uh, look their best. We're gonna go in here and we're gonna tape up uh, all of these edges. Uh, it's not a uh, practice in art. It doesn't take that long uh, to tape up a car. I'm gonna throw it on there, I'm gonna protect the edges. It doesn't need to look uh, neat. It's another part of Ferraris. You can get them from the factory with burned edges. And then if they've gone through other detailers, Chances are they've got more burnt edges or very thinned edges. So we're gonna be extremely careful as we're going through here. So hopefully that gives you a little bit better idea of what we do to get ready for the polishing process, to figure out which process uh, is gonna work best and why we go through uh, all of those efforts to make this uh, look its best. Okay, now we're gonna take a closer look at uh, our test section that we're gonna work on. And we're not just gonna go in here and do a real quick test section to see what the paint looks like. We want to talk a bit about what exactly we're doing, why we're doing it, and how these steps can help you if you're learning how to polish or maybe you're already polishing and you want to figure out how to uh, maybe improve your techniques a little bit. And some of this stuff is the exact same thing that we teach in Elite Detailer Academy. We've got students come in from all over the world to learn these uh, same techniques. I'm gonna share these uh, with you uh, sitting behind your, your computer and trying to learn uh, these processes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a few different areas. First, I'm gonna do a relatively flat uh, area uh, that's on the top surface. Then we're gonna move down to the side and we're gonna do a little bit more challenging area. It's a vertical surface and it has a lot of uh, curvature to it. And you can pick something up uh, on, on both of these. So when I'm working on it, whether I'm, I'm doing a test section or whether I'm actually working this panel, there's a few things that I wanna do. One, I want to kind of take a look how the panel is broken up and I wanna plan my section accordingly. Uh, I'm not gonna do an area over here 
that leaves me three inches on the end. I want to take this, you know, geometrically break it up. You know, I'm going to look at this. And I'm going to say this is going to be like one, two, three, four, five, probably six different sections all in this area uh, right here. Most people work way too big uh, of sections. I want to take a look at this. I'm not going to do a test section right here in the middle of this curvature. Um, I'm going to incorporate those into my different sections uh, that I do. And then there's some more techniques that we can talk about uh, dealing with curvature like this. So when I'm doing it, the, the, the real basics that you want to look at, I want you to watch and see my work area, see how small it is. Think about how that is relative to what you may be doing at home. Uh, so we're going to keep that small. We're going to keep our overlaps about uh, 50%. Pad flatness. Pad flatness is just absolutely critical when you're doing this. Uh, and it becomes more of a challenge when you're dealing with curvature. And particularly on this vertical surface here, it says all curvature. So you can't keep it completely flat, but there's kind of a, a right way uh, and wrong way. One thing you can do is you can have a friend sit there, take a little bit of video, pull out the phone, take some video of you working, snap some photos. And you'd be surprised, particularly if you're working a little bit further uh, area out, people had a tendency to go out, they lock this arm into place, and as it goes out, it wheelies. You don't want that uh, to happen. You can lose a tremendous amount of cut and finish if that pad is not uh, staying flat on the surface. So how do you know if it's not staying flat? Well. If you're working a flat area and all of a sudden the, the spin or the rotation of the pad changes dramatically or stops, one or two things happening. All of a sudden you went really heavy on pressure or the more likely of the two, your pad's not flat. And if that happens, just make an adjustment. You'll be able to feel the difference. You'll be able to see the difference and you'll be able to hear the difference in the machine between when it kind of stalls out as people like to call it or when it continues to spin. Watch my arm speed. Very slow, methodical uh, arm speed. Uh, your, your machine speed comes into play. Most of the time, if you're using like a Rupus uh, machine, particularly the Mark IIs, you're gonna be at speed four, four and a half. There's no need to go uh, uh, you know, crank it up to six. You're not gonna get work done uh, faster. You're gonna overheat it and a lot of other kind of uh, issues that you're gonna run into. So your machine speed is uh, critical uh, as well. And another thing is pressure. Pressure is not going to be something that you're going to be able to pick up on over the camera, but I am putting a good amount of pressure on it. If you can take your machine, put it on a set of uh, bathroom scales, you get that, let's call it between 15 and 20 pounds of pressure. That's about where you want to be on the compounding stage. Having said that, there's always some uh, variations for techniques that are going to be fine. They're going to be different from one person to the next, but they get the same uh, results done, which that is fine. I know this system you know, works well for us. We teach this system uh, and it works quite well. So uh, I'll grab the machine. We'll work on this. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing and then we'll switch over to the vertical surface here and kind of show you how I uh, handle that. So I'll grab my trusty Rupus machine. Make sure I got uh, the right uh, product. This is uh, Jeskar correcting compound. I'm using about three drops on it. That's all you need. And then I've got my shirt down over my belt buckle. Don't want to rub up against that. And first thing first, I just rub it into the surface a little bit. Uh, you don't have to paint a pretty picture of the whole outline of the area. That's just to keep it from flying everywhere. So I rub it in a little bit and you'll see me um, spread it out some more. Then I'll slow down into my uh, pattern. Basically, I'm doing two sets left, right, two sets up, down. For the amount of pressure, the amount of product, the machine speed, and the area that I'm working in, that's the breakdown cycle on it. So. So you can see when I was working on it, I mean, I kept that area small. It was from here to here. And even if I had a wide open space, I'm not gonna go much uh, bigger than that. The smaller the area, the better the correction, the quicker the correction uh, that you're gonna get. 
Now here we have a couple things going on. We've got curvature where it comes down inside and then out here in the edge, it curves over. So as I'm coming back, I'm keeping the pad flat, but I'm also rotating the machine. So if you see a little bit of, of lift in there, it's because I'm hitting this last bit of angle. If I just kept it flat here, the top area is not going to get full correction. Same thing if you noticed, or if you go back and rewind, as I was getting down in here, you'll notice the rotation slowed down considerably because the pad is starting to go into that, that uh, valley a little bit. It kept rotating. It didn't stop. You know, I want to be able to feel that machine go down into that area. And likewise, I want it to rotate here. So I'll over exaggerate. If you're working this area, you know, you want this way and then you want to come up and over like this as you're working it. That keeps a nice flat surface um, as you're, uh, you're working that area. Now, once I wipe this off, it's another thing about wiping uh, off surfaces. We talk about this in class every time. Keep this folded in force. I don't want to see any bunching up uh, like this. You can scratch the surface. So keep it folded in force. That distributes uh, the pressure on it. And then you want to wipe in one direction. So if I'm wiping back and forth this direction, and if I take my light and I go to inspect and I look at it, if I see lines going back and forth this way, I know I scratched it with my towel. I need to grab a different towel. But let's say if I was in here and I was wiping all over the place, and if I find items going like this, did I cause it with a towel? Or is that stuff left over that I didn't get during the compounding stage? If I'm wiping one direction, and I see stuff going every direction, then I know I didn't do a good enough job yet. So try to keep your wiping going in one direction as much as you possibly can. Keep your towel folded in force. A lot of people would look at what we just did here and think that's finished. There's body shops out there that would love to be able to get this kind of finish after three different stages. This is after one stage. So what I'm making sure is I'm making sure that all the defects are gone. Any directional scratches, any heavy stuff. If I see anything other than that super fine haze in there, I know I didn't get it fully corrected. I could put another drop on there. I can come back and, and work that uh, little area. We're trying to get as good of cut and good of finish as we possibly can during this compounding stage. So when I go back with finishing polish, all I'm doing is removing a little bit of haze. I'm not chasing defects in my finish polishing. If you're doing that, you're not doing something correctly in your compounding stage. If you have a lot of defects still left in there, try another one right next to it. This time, up your pressure a little bit uh, or bring your work area in a little bit. Have somebody watch you to make sure that you're keeping your pad flat. Uh, you can go back and you can read what that paint is telling you. You can have the same tools and the same speed, same everything that I'm doing your pressure can be off by just two pounds and you can lose 20 or 30% cut and finish off of it. So don't be afraid to put a little bit of pressure, test the different areas, uh, try to figure out what's going to work best for you on the paint that you're working on with the tools and everything that you have. So do that before you start switching off different pads and compounds, or you just make it easy. Use what we're using. We've already spent years vetting this whole process and figuring out what, uh, what works best. So, Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of what goes into it. And it also gives you, let's say you're a Ferrari owner, uh, gives you a better appreciation of why there's the expense that there is in doing this. Because A, it takes an extreme amount of knowledge. B, it takes a tremendous amount of time. So the amount of time spent in this one little area, multiply that by how many times over the entire car and stopping and taping and inspecting and making sure everything uh, looks good. This is a very laborious task. Um, it's a high skill level and there's no way to cheat time on it. If somebody's saying they're gonna do a multi-stage uh, paint correction and it's gonna be a couple hours or just a couple hundred bucks, run away. It doesn't work that. You can't cheat physics. It takes time to get this right. So having said all that, Let's take a look at this vertical surface, uh, surface here so you can see how I work with uh, the contour a bit to get the most out of it. Okay, now that we've looked at 
our top horizontal surfaces. Let's take a look at uh, the vertical surfaces on it. So we talked about pad flatness when we're up here on uh, the horizontal surface. That is pretty darn easy. Uh, even the fact that we had a little bit of contour up in here, it's not like here. I mean, take a look at this surface. This is constantly bending. How do we keep a pad flat uh, in here? Well, you can't keep it completely flat, but the process that you go through uh, to make it flat can make uh, a massive difference. And here's one thing that I found uh, over the years, specifically working on Ferraris. Not many Ferraris that don't have uh, a lot of curvature to it. But as I'm working this pad through here, I really pay close attention to this curvature in this direction. This is really where I want to focus keeping my pad flat. I want to work with that curvature. So imagine your hand going over here, say you're applying wax. Your hand is always going to move with the contour of the surface. You want your pad, the middle of that pad, to do the same thing as much as you possibly can. Not on the edge, unless you're getting back here, you may rock the pad back a, a little bit. And likewise, up at the top here, you want to roll over. Just like we did when we were working this surface, you want the pad to come over. Here, you want it to overlap onto that top so you get the top uh, bit of it. But as you're going left and right, you're not going to have as much contact to it. So if, if you go just spending a bunch of time left and right, and then you do another section beside it, and you just spend a bunch of time going up and down, I guarantee you which one of those is going to give you better correction. It's that up and down. But we still want to go a, a left and right just to even uh, things out. So I'm still going to work this in a small area, and I'm going to take it to this body line right here, up to this body line right here. I'll do this completely separately. Don't try to come over and work yet another area. Anytime you have body lines separating an area, that's your work area. It might be a real small work area followed by uh, a little bit larger work area. Break that up because if you try to go here and focus on a different angle, you're going to spread things too thin and you're going to have a bunch of decently corrected paint. We're not going for that. We're going for as close to perfection as we can in a safe manner. I'm going to work a small area. Watch how I work with this contour right here. And you're also going to see the same thing we're working this top surface. You're going to see slow, methodical arm movements. You're going to see 50% overlap. My pressure's basically the same as what uh, it is up here. But by, by trying to keep that pad, work with the contour of the panel as much as possible, you're going to get be uh, better results out of it. So I'll stop talking now. I'll get here to, uh, to polishing. Once again, stop, pause, rewind, rewatch it. If you're at home in your garage, practice uh, kind of how I'm doing it. So I'll uh, be quiet and I'll get uh, to working this. Okay, as you can see, I stayed in about the same uh, uh, work size as I did up here. I worked a lot at that curvature of the panel. I did some overlap here at the top, and I did some overlap here at the bottom. Now, you might be worried about you know, this being thinner uh, edges, which is a good thing to worry about. Uh, but we've inspected all this. Everything looks good. If you ran into a situation where you're concerned about it, or let's say it's a car like an F40 or whatever, you, know, you can go ahead and put a super thin strip of tape along this top area. You can do the same thing right at that top edge to minimize um, you know, how much time that, that you're spending on it. Another technique that you can do if you're working these areas, you know, I might be working up in here and I may stop and just work that top area a little bit. And then I can come down here and I can do that same process just overlapping the low part. And I can do the same thing side to side. I'll just kind of show you real quick. You know, I can rock that back and forth. And what I was doing, I was tilting the pressure back. So my pressure was focused only right here. 
I've already done all this. I know that it looks good. Um, you know, that is the exception to keeping a pad flat. I'm only thinking about this little area. So I'm going to take the pad and I'm going to uh, rotate the pressure down. So it's focusing all that polishing energy right down here at the bottom. Likewise, if I'm up here, I'll rotate it up and over. I'll make sure that all my pressure is focused on this last inch or so. And I can either go this way or back and forth or both depending on the condition of it. And because I'm keeping things moving, I'm not building up uh, a lot of heat in here. It'd be different if I was just sitting up here like this for long periods of time, but I'm just overlapping it. I'll back off my pressure just a little bit. I keep the pad moving. That'll keep the, the temperatures down. So as you go around a car like this and you have all these different swooping panels, you got the negative uh, uh, contours, you got concaves, uh, you got convex, uh, very complex shapes to it. And the better way to approach these is by breaking them down into smaller components. If you have a big flat hood, it's a little easier. You can just go in blocks. But as you're dealing with all of these curves and contours, think in terms of smaller areas. I can take a look at this. I can inspect. Normally I would stop and I'd use Geon Prep and I'd wipe all that uh, down, but you don't need to learn how to spray prep onto a surface. I think you can figure that one out. Uh, if not, go to my video on uh, Geon Prep. We talked about uh, that a little bit. But hopefully this whole process gave you a better understanding of exactly what goes into correcting a Ferrari in particular. It's a completely different beast than if you're working on your normal square boxy uh, daily driver. You have to respect what this car is. You have to think about its history moving forward. These cars are going to be around a long, long time. Um, you have to be careful. You have to assume that somebody worked on this before you that didn't quite know what they're doing. And you don't want to be the person who uncovers a problem area uh, because then it becomes a really expensive uh, endeavor. Um, if some of you are looking at this uh, and you haven't followed us in the past, and you know, we've done 200 videos or so, uh, written many, many articles over the year. We run a professional detailer academy. We've got people come in from all over the world uh, to, uh, to learn what we're doing. One of the differentiators about us, when you're talking about you know, where you can go on YouTube or other places to learn about detailing, about paint correction, about coatings, about paint protection film, whatever else, we do this every single day. We're not just getting in, the, in front of the camera every now and then and have somebody else uh, take care of all the business. Um, although I like to consider myself the pretty face in front of uh, uh, the camera, um, I work on cars all the time still. Despite the fact that my uh, back surgeon and neurologist don't want me to work on cars anymore, uh, we still do it. We're constantly testing. We're constantly evaluating. Um, you can come into the shop anytime chances are you're going to find me, Dan, everybody else working on cars, figuring out what works best. You want to come in, you want to take a look at some of our work. We have an open door policy here. If you want to come in, you want to see how we do this, talk through the process, show you the difference between a paint that is perfect or near perfect uh, and something else, come on in. We have an open door policy. We'd love to have anybody uh, stop on by. So yeah, we went over a lot of information in these last two. Uh, hopefully you picked up a lot of uh, uh, tips. Watch the video multiple times, rewind uh, to different uh, areas, um, and don't forget to, to share it uh, on your favorite forums, uh, Facebook groups, or, or whatever else. Share it with your friends. You've got some Ferrari friends out there. Make sure they watch uh, this entire series so they can get a really appreci good appreciation for what goes into uh, making a Ferrari look the way uh, a Ferrari uh, deserves. So we'll kind of take a break here. We'll move on uh, to the next uh, video in the series. Uh, if you have any questions or comments on these processes, leave them down below. Don't forget to hit that like button, uh, subscribe if you're not uh, uh, already, and stay tuned for this entire series. This has uh, been a fun one so far, and we're going over a lot of information, and we love uh, sharing it with you, our viewers. That's about all for today for the Ferrari 488 Esoteric Car Care. I'm Todd Cooperrider. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.